Today's Morning Mass is brought to you in part by these sponsors. Good evening, everybody. My name is Jeff Gokey, and I'm here with my wife, Kathy. Tonight, we just want to take a quick second. Um, life is very busy, especially if you have kids going to junior high, grade school, high school, or even college. And we ask questions every day about what's going on with today, what's, uh, what's happening today, what's going on with the kids, questions about what should I wear, what's for dinner, uh, even how do I get everything done that I need to do today? But then there are bigger questions. Why are we here? Why do we exist? What's my purpose? Where am I heading? Will my kids grow up and follow the church? Is there more to life than this? So we need more time to think. We need more time to pray, to consider all the big questions in life. Well, there's a program that's going on for the third time, a third session called Alpha. And it's here to help us with that. Alpha is a place to explore the big questions in life. It's things that you want to consider. The questions that you have that you may think that is silly, uh, you'd be embarrassed to ask. The questions are the same questions that I would have. Alpha, it's a place that we gather where it's very welcoming. It's a friendly environment where there's a lot of great food desserts, and there's a lot of engagement and discussion with people just like you and I asking the same questions. Alpha is a place to listen. We listen to other people's life journey, and we think about those questions and the deeper meaning of life that we ask ourselves, and then we internalize that, and we discuss how do those questions that we ask every day to ourselves, why are we here, what's God's purpose, what is our purpose in life, how does that apply to us when we talk about it? The, like I said, this is the third session. The first session we had 50 people. The second we had 70 plus people. So it's growing and people seem to be engaged with this. And I think it's something that you, a lot of you may really enjoy or know someone who would enjoy this. The program become, becomes highly recommended by national speakers such as Father Mike Schmidt, Father John Ricardo, Pope Francis, and even more importantly, Father Joe. So it's free to attend. It's once a week for 11 weeks on Tuesday evenings. It's from 6.30 to 8. We, we, we never go longer than that. There's a full meal, so that night you don't have to worry about dinner. And whether you know a lot about your faith in God or you're not even sure God exists, this is a great environment to grow. It's a place to explore life's big and small questions. The fall session starts on September 13th. It's at Henry on 11th. And we're actually having on, on this coming Tuesday, we're having a come and see evening. If you, if you just wanna come and see kind of what it's all about, seven o'clock on Tuesday, there'll, there'll be some light snacks. So please come and check it out, no pressure. So if you have any further questions on this, we'll be in the back of the church after mass answer some of your questions, fill out a card, and again, as Kathy said, uh, just find out something about it, uh, no pressure at all, and like I said, the worst thing that can happen is you come away with a very full stomach, you lose your diet, and you learn a little bit about why in the world you're here on this earth serving God. Thank you for your time. Welcome to St. Isidore's. Today we celebrate the 21st Sunday of Ordinary Time. To begin, let's recognize God's presence in each other by welcoming those around us. With full heart and full voice, let's begin our celebration by singing together number 303, Gather Us In, number 303. Our fears and our dreamings rise. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace and peace of God our Father and the Lord Jesus be with you. And with your spirit. As we gather to celebrate the Eucharist today, we pause. We ask Jesus to forgive us our sins. Lord Jesus, you call us to be your disciples. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ Jesus, you send us out to proclaim your love to all the world. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord Jesus, you strengthen us in our journey with your presence in the Eucharist. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to life everlasting. Amen. Amen. O God, who caused the minds of the faithful to unite in this single purpose, grant your people to love what you command and to desire what you promise, that amid the uncertainties of this world, our hearts may be fixed on that place where true gladness is found. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, I know their works and their thoughts, and I come to gather nations of every language. They shall come and see my glory. I will set a sign among them. From them I will send fugitives to the nations, to Tarshish, Put, Lud, Mosak, Tubal, Javan, to the distant coastlands, that have never heard of my fame or seen my glory. And they shall proclaim my glory among the nations. They shall bring all your brothers and sisters from all the nations as an offering to the Lord, on horses and in chariots, in carts, upon mules and dromedaries, to Jerusalem, my holy mountain, says the Lord. Just as the Israelites bring their offerings to the house of the Lord in clean vessels, some of these I will take as priests and Levites, says the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Go out 
into all the world and tell the good news. Go out to all the world and tell the good news. Praise the Lord, all you nations. steadfast is his kindness toward us, and the fidelity of the Lord endures forever. Go out to all the world and tell the good news. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Brothers and sisters, you have forgotten the exhortation addressed to you as children. My son, do not disdain the principle of the Lord or lose heart when reproved by him. For whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. He scourges every son he acknowledges. Endure your trials as discipline. God treats you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? At the time, all discipline seems a cause not for joy, but for pain. Yet later, it brings the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who are trained by it. So straighten your drooping hands and your weak knees. Make straight paths for your feet that what is lame may not be disjointed, but healed. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May the Lord be in your heart and on your lips that you may worthily and fit be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus passed through the towns and villages, teaching as he went and making his way to Jerusalem. And someone asked him, Lord, will only a few people be saved? And he answered them, Strive to enter through the narrow gate. For many, I tell you, will attempt to enter, but will not be strong enough. After the master of the house has risen and locked the door, then will you stand outside knocking and saying, Lord, open the door for us. He will say to you in reply, I do not know where you are from. And you will say, we ate and drank in your company, and you taught in our streets. Then he will say to you, I do not know where you are from. Depart from me, all you evildoers, and there will be wailing and grinding of teeth. When you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob 
and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourself are cast out, and people will come from the east and the west, and from the north and the south, and will recline at table in the kingdom of God. For behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. In the second reading today, we hear from the letter of the Hebrews that we should not disdain discipline. At the time when discipline is administered, it's not a cause for joy, but later on we look back and we're grateful uh, for the discipline because of the rewards we reap from that. Whenever I read that passage in scripture, I go back in history to 1989. In 1989, I went out on vacation to the Tetons where I often go, and my goal was to climb Mount Owen, the last of the Teton peaks. I had climbed all the others, and my goal in life was to climb every one of them. And Mount Owen was the most difficult um, and uh, demanded the most skill, But I was all filled with confidence because the year before I'd climbed Mount Moran, and that was a pretty complicated climb too, and did very well. And so I was all excited about it. I didn't prepare very well. I went out there, and it was an absolute disaster. I really didn't even get to the base of the climb, and I was exhausted. And I turned back, and I came home very sad, but more determined than ever that I was going to climb that mountain the next year. The first thing I did when I got home is I took my film to a photographer, had him blow up a big picture of Mount Owen. I hung it on the wall in my bedroom, and I made up my mind that I would get up at 4.30 every morning and go out and jog or uh, hike for five miles with a bag of sand in my backpack and weights on my boots. And I did that every morning, all fall, all winter, all spring, and through most of the summer in good weather, in bad weather, in stormy weather, in blizzards, and I hated every minute of it. And every morning when that alarm clock went off, I tried to talk myself and then, oh, I'm gonna take this morning off. And then I said, no, I'm gonna climb that mountain. And um, I went out in late August, and I climbed the mountain with a guide. I wouldn't have made it on my own, but I climbed it with a guide and It was a piece of cake. It was so enjoyable. I wasn't exhausted at all. And I'll never forget climbing up that last chimney and expecting a couple more climbs or a hundred feet ahead. And I realized I was climbing out in the top. And I remember that now 32 years later and ever since then every day, uh, the joy of that exhilaration. And um, I hardly ever think of all the the grueling exercises I went through. but having fulfilled that goal of climbing every one of those major peaks um, has been a satisfaction ever since then. In today's gospel, somebody asked the question of Jesus, will many people be saved? And Jesus says, try to get in through the narrow gate. Many will try and will not make it. And once the door is closed, they'll be in the outside banging and saying, we visit with you, we listen to you in the streets, and he will say, get out of my sight, I don't know who you are. Um, I think we need to think about that often. I think today the tendency of most people is to think that heaven is automatic, God loves us so much, you can do whatever you want, and he'll let you in. But it doesn't seem that that's what Jesus is saying, and people like... Uh, uh, Sister uh, Wachowski, Faustina, she had visions of hell, and uh, the children of Fatima did too, and many, many people are headed that way. God is infinitely love and infinitely merciful. We have the image of a a divine mercy in front of our our, um, podium here, and look at it often. God wants us to be within heaven, He'll do anything to get us there. He's so merciful. But we have to take some initiative. We have to turn to him and seek for forgiveness. Last Sunday afternoon, after the wonderful parade, I went and spent a couple hours with my sister in the nursing home, and I showed her a talk on the divine mercy. 
And in the course of the talk, the sister who was giving it talked about Rudolf Hess. Maybe some of the old timers remember the name. Um, as a young man, he was a Catholic. His parents were encouraging him to think about the priesthood, and he was thinking about it. And his dad died when he was only six, 15 years old. And then the First World War started in Europe, and he was in the army, and he distinguished himself with great service. He was wounded three times. He received the Iron Cross, the highest medal you can get in the, in the, the German army. And as a result, uh, after the war, the, the Nazis came into power, and uh, Rudolf Hessmann got caught up with the Nazi philosophy. Adolf Hitler noticed him, and he made him the commandant at Auschwitz, the most horrible of the concentration camps. He was there for three years, from 41 to 44, and he was uh, responsible for the death of two million people. Children, men and women, tortured in many ways, um, horrible, horrible crimes, and he never felt the least bit of remorse. At first, it bothered him to kill small children, but then he realized they'll grow up and they can become your enemies, so it's good to get rid of them. And um, during that time that he was competent, um, a Jesuit community in Poland, uh, all the members, about 25 priests and brothers and religious sisters, were all taken by the Nazis and sent to Auschwitz, where they died uh, after being worked to death or being tortured or whatever. The only one who's of that community who survived was the, the, the um, head honcho, the, uh, the principal or whatever, and he wasn't home when the Nazis arrested all the members of his community. But he wanted to be with them, and so he went to Auschwitz, and he asked to be admitted. And the guard said, you have to be absolutely crazy. Nobody wants to come to Auschwitz. Uh, people are trying to get out of here. But they took him to the competent, to Rudolf Hess, thinking that surely he will kill this man. But for some strange re reason, uh, the competent sent him home. He wouldn't let him stay there. Maybe he was thinking, maybe he'll suffer more, knowing that all of his conferers, his family really, are all here suffering and dying, and he's free to go as he please. Whatever reason, he was released. Uh, the war finally ended. Rudolf Hessel managed to escape for a while, but then somebody found out who he was and reported him. And he was tried at Nuremberg in 1947 uh, and was uh, sentenced to be hung at Auschwitz, the camp where he had been uh, the leader for three years. He wasn't afraid to die. Even at the trial, he confessed all of his crimes and thought he was doing a good thing. And he was obeying orders, and he had so uh, taken up the Nazi uh, philosophy and so on. But the judge also sentenced him to spend time at a Polish prison camp. And that really frightened him, because he knew that many of the guards, he had murdered members of their family, tortured them in horrible ways and so on. And so he was terrified in going to that prison camp. And he was so surprised when he got there. Instead of being tortured and treated with hatred and insulted in every possible way, they treated him with such kindness and goodness and gentleness, he couldn't believe what was happening. And he said he had never experienced such mercy in all of his life. They could have tortured him in any way and he would have felt it was coming to him but he just wasn't ready to accept all that kind of kindness and mercy. It was just so foreign to him. And uh, as a result, it caused him to think about his childhood days and his early faith, and it led to his conversion. And then he asked the guards that they would bring a priest to hear his confession. And they contacted all the Polish priests in the area, and none of them wanted to come to him. He was referred by the whole Polish population as the animal at Auschwitz. Uh, because of his cruelty and his horrible life there. Um, and finally, he remembered the name of the priest, the Jesuit, that he had let go, who he wouldn't allow to stay. He said, if you could please find this priest and bring him to me. And they finally found him about five days before he was to be hung. And the priest was somewhat reluctant to come because you can imagine the feelings he had. He had wiped out all of his uh, priests and his brothers and religious sisters. 
Uh, many of them were tortured horribly and died of a sort of starvation and everything else. But he came. Uh, he had been at the shrine of uh, Divine Mercy. And he came and Rudolf Hess made his confession. It took about three or four hours. And finally, uh, the priest gave him absolution. The next day, he came back to the camp and gave him communion. And then three or four days later, he was taken to Auschwitz and he was hung. But he died in peace. He confessed his crimes uh, and he asked the Polish people to try as best they could to forgive him. Uh, that's how great God's mercy is. And I hope someday if we get to heaven, and remember it's an if, but if we do, I hope we'll meet Rudolf Hess and see him as a saint. Not because of anything he did, he did so many horrible things, but because of God's great love and mercy. And I think uh, Adolf, uh, Rudolf Hess is the best example of why there is a need for purgatory too. Some of our Protestant brothers say, uh, yeah, we are washed clean of our sins no matter how great they are by the blood of the Lamb. And I believe that, but I think there are also consequences for our actions because God is just. And it would seem that if Mother Teresa died and went straight to heaven, and Rudolf Hess died and went straight to heaven because of the mercy of God, somewhere along the line, justice would not be there. But I've found an answer to my problem that I had in the, all the ways through my seminary, visiting with people who've had near-death experiences. And those who really get deep into it come into the presence of Jesus, and he asks one question, show me what you've done with your life, and you see every single thing you've ever done, every thought you've ever did, and you experience the consequences of your actions on others. If you brought them joy, you experience that joy. If it caused them pain, you experience that pain. Through it all, Jesus loves you, but he lets you see what you've done with your life. Imagine what Rudolf Hess must have gone through, seeing what he did in causing two million people to suffer horrible, first of all, mentally, and then physically and emotionally, and then be put to death. That would be worse than any hell you could imagine. But at the end of it all, and maybe the end will be only an eternity for him, but in the end, through God's great love and mercy, hopefully, um, he will be in heaven. So I think we need to think about that often. And just as I focus my attention for a whole year, getting up early in the morning and climbing that mountain, uh, we have to keep our focus on heaven every day and realize it's not just a given. We can do whatever we want and maybe say we're sorry once in a while. No, we have to use the means that God has given us. Receiving the sacraments faithfully, including reconciliation. So many people no longer think it's necessary. I think they'll be sadly surprised when Jesus says, I gave you all these opportunities and you continue to hang on to your sins. And then we'll have to endure the consequences. So we need to make use of the sacraments God has given us. We need to turn to God every day in prayer and realize our destiny is eternal life. That's the most important job we have in getting there and helping our families get there and then work at it every day through a life of prayer, receiving the sacraments often, never missing Mass on Sunday unless we're so sick that we can't make it or it's simply impossible, but not just taking that, well, we can skip a Sunday here and there and go fishing or whatever. No, we have to take our obligations seriously. God is a God of love and mercy. He's also a God of justice. And he will judge us. He won't judge us. We will judge ourselves on our life review, showing what we've done and seeing the consequences of our actions. The good news is we have God who loves us with an infinite love. He's willing to let a guy like a Rudolf Hess into heaven. He's willing to let us in too but we have to turn for him, seeking his pardon, mercy, grace, and forgiveness. So think about that often. Pray about it every day. Try to deepen your relationship with the Lord by what you say and do. And then we can look forward to the day when we'll give a, 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 an account of our lives in the presence of the Lord Jesus. So with that in mind, let's stand a professor of faith. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things, visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, 
the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us men and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the mercy to come. Amen. O God, our Heavenly Father, your Son Jesus has revealed to us as a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of forgiveness. Help us always to turn to our Father in heaven through you, seeking that pardon, mercy, and forgiveness and love. Grant us this, Lord, in the favors we ask in Jesus' name. For Archbishop Lucas and the leadership of the Archdiocese of Omaha and the efforts to further the kingdom of God in new ways, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For peace throughout our nation during this time of turmoil, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for people throughout the world who are suffering from extreme heat, flooding, fires, storms, and other natural disasters, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for all who are ill, especially for Julie Baumgart, Karen Blazer, Rollin and Betty Davidson, Betty Hergott, Mary Jureski, Charlie Jasper, Brian and Janet Kaup, Rita Murphy, Ray Wrinkle, Mike Schrant, Tom Schimmick, Joanne Stock, John Weber, and Dan Wilson, that they may experience the healing presence of Jesus, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for all who have died, especially for Kathy Beauville, Beauvais, Dorothy Gables, Alvin Richmuth, Larm, and Wormpo, that they may know the joys of eternal life, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For all who mourn the loss of a loved one, that their faith in Jesus will be a source of comfort and peace to them, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For each of us, that we'll be ready to give an account of our lives to the Lord Jesus when he calls us, and that he will embrace us and welcome us into the joys of his kingdom, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For much needed rain and for continued favorable weather throughout the rest of the growing season, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For more vocations of priesthood and religious life, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for doctors and nurses and for all who participate in the healing ministry of Jesus in hospitals and nursing homes, that God may bless them in their ministry to the sick and elderly, we pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. Now let us pray the living and deceased of the Rhodey and Redsdorf families for whom this Mass is being offered. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. And for all of our unspoken needs and intentions, let us pause and pray to the Lord in silence. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. O God, our Father in heaven, please grant us these and all our needs, for which we pray to you today in Jesus' name, for he is Lord forever and ever. Amen. 
As the gifts in the table are being prepared, please join in singing number 396, drawn to you number 396. <clears throat> Drawn to you, Lord, we are drawn to you, to the beauty of your presence in this place. Here for you, God, we are here for you, as the gifts we bring become a feast of grace. We are drawn to you. the love that you have poured on us we bring these gifts works of our hands you gather all we offer to yourself receive our prayer drawn to you Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. O Lord, who gained for yourself a people of, by adoption through the one sacrifice offered once for all, bestow graciously on us, we pray, the gifts of unity and peace in your church. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And 
and with your spirit lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God. For you laid the foundations of the world and have arranged for the changings of times and seasons. You have formed man in your own image and set humanity over the whole world in all its wonders to rule in your name over all you have made and forever praise your mighty works through Christ our Lord. And so with all the angels we praise you, as in joyful celebration we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created right to give you praise. For, for through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and the working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. And therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you by the same Spirit graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come, until you come again. And therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray upon the oblation of your church and, reconcil- and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself. Grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with this Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, with St. Joseph, St. Isidore, and with all your saints on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing help. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, 
with your servant Francis, our Pope, and George, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, the entire people your son has gained for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family whom you summoned before you. In your compassion, O merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. To our departed brothers and sisters, and to all who are pleasing to other after, after passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory through Christ our Lord, through whom we bestow in the world all that is good. Through him, with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and form of divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy, we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory is now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with all of you. And with your spirit. Share with one another a sign of Christ's peace. 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 of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. Please join me in making a spiritual communion. 
My Jesus, I believe you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you if you are already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. As a community, we come to receive the Lord. As we come, please sing number 308 in this place, number 308. <clears throat> gathered as people who are living 
Let us pray. Complete within us, O Lord, we pray, the healing work of your mercy, and graciously perfect and sustain us, so that in all things we may please you, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We extend our deepest sympathy to John Beauvais and to his children, Joey and JC, JP and, Jeremy and Jamie, whose wife and mother Kathy uh, died very suddenly last Wednesday evening. Uh, funeral arrangements are still pending, probably toward the end of this coming week. So please remember the Beauvais family in your prayers. Maybe you noticed uh, we might move the houses this coming week. So that'll be a great thing happening. And also in the back, we have a giving tree uh, for the uh, Columbus uh, House Building Project for the poor. Um, some of those uh, tags on that tree are pretty expensive. Maybe you can't afford to give that much, but you can always pick up an envelope and put a five or 10 or whatever, and this way help out. It's a community-wide project. All the churches are working with this, uh, the city itself. So um, if you make a donation, fine. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Mass is ended. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let's go forth singing number 732. Alleluia, sing to Jesus. Number 732. Today's Morning Mass is brought to you in part by these sponsors. 